All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of 1920 Negro National League, uh, powered by Out of the Park Baseball. And we've got author, historian, teacher, Negro League uh, researcher, Kevin L. Mitchell with us today. I'm going to get him on here. There you are, Kevin. All right. <laughs> How you doing? All right. Welcome, sir. I appreciate you taking the time and, and coming on here. Uh, we Thank were just you. talking a little bit before we got started and, and what this is all about. And, and we're going to talk about what you're up, what you've been up to and, and your book and some other things. And, um, you know, kind of my effort here to try to take back a little piece of the Internet, <laughs> you know, maybe back to the way it was intended, right, about information and learning and and, and, you know, connecting people's experiences and, and this about Negro League history, I think, is such an important part of uh, uh, not just baseball history, but um, also the country's history, you know, and, and, and so much more. So um, welcome, sir. I appreciate you taking the time. Okay. So um, we talked a little bit. I mean, you've uh, you've been involved um, recently in teaching a, a few classes, uh, what what uh, uh, where's that at? University of Kansas? Where, where did you, where's that at that you were teaching well, those classes? Yeah, it, it, it's called the um, OSHA Life Lifelong Learning Institute uh, at the University of Kansas, and these are basically classes for um, older, mature people who are just wanted to learn um, different topics about uh, different things. And sports is one of them, and um, you know I, I I talk with them about uh, classes dealing with Negro League baseball, and they had an interest, and that's that's what I that's what I've been doing for the last two years. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so we talked a little bit about it, but just so everybody uh, hears that story as well, how you were how you became involved in in doing some research and in and doing the writing of your book, Last Train to Cooperstown. Yeah, well, like I told you, Phil, I'm I've been a lifetime lifetime baseball fan. Uh, grew up in in Kansas City uh, during the um, um, golden era of baseball, the 1950s. Um, you know, we grew up uh, idolizing guys like Willie Mays and Ernie Banks and and Henry Aaron. And as I got older, uh, I learned that they were all products of Negro League baseball, mm -hmm. and uh, that that started me to do some research and I did some things to learn. We had some books about uh, Josh Gibson, uh, B Buck Leonard, and of course, uh, Satchel Page. And then uh, in 2006, they had um, that, that group of 17 that, that from Negro League Baseball that was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I saw some of the names and, and I realized I didn't know uh, much about them. You know, guys like Frank Grant, and Cristobal Torrente, um, uh, Pete Hill. Uh, so I, I did some research, and I came up with a book uh, about uh, the profile of the of those seventeen. There were twelve players and, and five um, uh, executives. Mm -hmm. One, of course, being uh, Effa Manley, who yes. was a part owner of the Newark Eagles, and is the only woman that's inducted into uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. So um, that, that was my premise of, of putting the book together. Uh, it's called The Last Train to Cooperstown. And I, I visualized how it would be if all of those people were still alive and that they had a um, Hall of Fame uh, celebration like they do when they, when they induct people now. And I thought about if all those people uh, and, the, and their followers came to Cooperstown, it would be on this big train and that's why I called it the last last train to Cooperstown. Awesome, and you know, and it, it that's a good point, right? Uh, and I've talked about this with with other people as well. Um, it's unfortunate what happened and and why it happened, and you can't go back. But it's really, really important, uh, like you and so many others, you know, do uh, all the time is researching more, telling the stories, finding out more, getting those out there to people who are not aware of it. Because, you know, I've been a baseball fan my whole life. Grew, grew up, a, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, uh, grew up, I'm still a Pennsylvania sports fan, even though I'm down here in Texas now. And 
I grew up uh, loving baseball, playing it as a little league, uh, you know, playing it into high school, playing a little bit in college, uh, and then um, began working in, in minor league baseball. And that was when I got to meet uh, many of the Negro League players who were still alive back in the late 80s, early 90s, when Reggie Jackson did a benefit night for these players. Because at the time, they weren't part of the Major League Baseball pension fund or any of that kind of stuff. And and it was it just fascinated me. And, and I just didn't realize, as much as I thought I knew about baseball, here was a whole slice of baseball history that I just had to find out more about. And I've been kind of hooked ever since. It's been, you know, 20, 30 years of digging and writing. And like I mentioned to you, I wrote, I've written a screenplay and some other things. And uh, I, I just, this is like, like I said, you know, the internet was intended, I think, to be uh, uh, informational and learning things. And it's turned into a lot of nonsense in a lot of, <laughs> in a lot of places. But I'm trying to take just a little piece of it and and, and, and try to get it back to where it, it, uh, it should be. So... Uh, so, so another thing too, right? So 1920, the Negro National League comes along. Um, how, how similar it is with today's uh, environment. I mean, you, you had the, uh, you know, similar social. Uh, right. Of course, we, we weren't coming out of a world war, thank goodness. No, right, <laughs> but, right, right. but, you know, the, um, the racial climate was very toxic. Yes. Back, back in 1920. And... I don't know if people realize, but the, the start of the Negro National League, um, Ruth Foster, who put it together, uh, that was done here in Kansas City, Missouri, at the uh, YMCA building on 18th mm -hmm. and Paseo, which mm -hmm. is right down the street from where the Negro League National Museum is mm -hmm. right now. Um, but it was a very um, transitional time in the, in the country. Uh, we were just coming off of World War I, and it was also a transitional time for, for baseball, for Major League Baseball, because they had just come off of the Black Sox scandal. Right. You know, the Chicago White Sox threw the World Series in 1919. And 1920 was also the year that uh, Major League Baseball elected uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis as the first uh, commissioner of baseball. And for the next two decades, a little more, uh, he participated with the owners of, of maintaining the uh, um, invisible color line mm -hmm. that kept um, African American and dark skinned Latinos out of uh, out of Major League Baseball. And 1920 was also the beginning of the, of the change in baseball from the dead ball era, mm -hmm. where Babe Ruth came into prominence in 1920, and that's when the uh, the long ball, the home run, started playing a big part. Uh, of the game. So uh, it was very uh, instrumental, I, I think, uh, at that particular time that the Negro National League uh, was formed. Right. And that, that's another great point, too, right? The uh, in, in 1994, there was the strike here and a lot of people right. soured, right. soured on, uh, right. on on players and money and this and everything was so involved. Right. And And then what happened to get that kind of out of it was 1998 and Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and the home Mark run and, right, right. and it just revitalized uh, the game again and it, it is it is kind of funny I mean you know I, I, I'm a big history guy I, how often history tends to repeat itself again sure. because sure. that point you made about Babe Ruth right I mean um, he came along and revolutionized the game he was trying to hit home runs for one uh, but he he, he uh, also you had manufacturing methods were different and they they outlawed the spitball and and all sorts of other things that changed the game and and it it really got it back uh, you know back into its heyday again because like yeah that, right. the Black Sox scandal that was a, that was a big uh, uh, a, a big scandal that that impacted the sport in 1919 so so um, I'm gonna put up. I really would love to know more about that process of um, if you uh, can tell us about that 2006 class and and uh, and and how many players were it start how many players started the funnel to, before they finally boiled it down to the 17 that got into uh, the Hall of Fame in 2006. Well, to start, I think just the fact that it was finally realized 
that um, uh, the Negro League Baseball was not represented in the Hall of Fame. No, right. Um, there was what eighteen of them right. in there before that. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. Right, right. At, 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 at that time, there had been, you know, like the Buck Leonard and the uh, Satchel Page and Josh Gibson, um, you know, um, and, and others, Judy Johnson, some others, but still, it, it was not representative. And so, Major League Baseball gave a grant to the Hall of Fame. And, and the Hall of Fame pulled, pulled together the, the historians, the, the Negro League historians at this time. We, we talked about the author of uh, Only the Ball Was Black, Only the Ball Was White, mm -hmm. uh, Black rather. Robert and Peterson, he, yeah. Right, Robert Peterson, he was still alive mm -hmm. at this time. And there were some others like Larry Lester and they, they, they um, uh, did research and they came um, with a group of, of, of Negro League players that they were wanted to recommend for uh, the Hall of Fame. And they, they went through the, the sorting process and um, they came out with, with about 50. And then they went through one more vote and that's where the, the 17 came into existence now. And, and that was a special committee, right? That they, that yes, they formed, yes, yes. like you said, because prior right. to, prior to that, wasn't there a, a, an agreement, uh, well, a, a procedure that there was actually a Negro League selection process every year right and didn't they do that, that for was, a while like ray dandridge was, got in that way right, several other players right right, right. That, why that did was, that stop why, what that, happened that, there they, they they stopped that and then they gave it to the veterans committee okay okay and then and then with the veterans committee uh there was some that came through uh but not you know rube foster i came came through the vet, veterans committee uh, guys like turkey stearns uh he he was elected through 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 the veterans committee but there was some were, were being elected, but it still was not a, a true representation no, of, no. of what Negro League Baseball uh, was about. And, and that generated the result of, of, of this, of the grant given and the committee put together for, for, th for further re research that was done. Yeah, think about that, right? I mean, uh, you know, 200 and some uh, members of the Hall of Fame, and there was 16 or 18, whatever it was, that were uh, that were from the Negro Leagues. And when you think about it, that number should have been, uh, would have been, had they been playing, oh, sure. uh, considerably, considerably higher. Still, and, right, right, right. And but really, people should realize that the Hall of Fame itself was was, was really not. Uh, it was started, but it was started on on a myth that baseball was uh, uh, invented by Abner Doubleday right. uh, out of the Cooperstown, New York, where he right. was from. And that was not the truth. The, the, no. The, that, that was not the truth. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, yeah. But anyway, they, they got down to the 50, and then they, they inducted the 17. There was some that were left out. Uh, of course, you and I talked about Buck O'Neill, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and guys like John Dallas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Rap, Rap Dixon. There's a move right now to try yes. to Rap Dixon to get in, and and then also Minnie Minoso, mm -hmm. who a lot of people feel based on what he did, not just what he did in the Negro leagues, but also in the major leagues, because he was really the first uh, uh, Hispanic a star in, in Major League Baseball. So um, you know, and then that there were there were others, but um, that were left out. But got down to the 17. As I said, twelve players and five uh, owners or managers in Negro Leagues, and they were inducted in two thousand six. So let's let's talk about them. Um, you've got the book. I'm going to put up. I, I put together a little presentation here okay. that's going to step through all of these uh, uh, players. And let me uh, let me throw that up here. You should be able to see that in a second. Okay. All right, so two thousand six, the Negro League Special Committee. We had the uh, inductions, and I'm going to flip through the players, and we could talk about them. So the first one we've got here was Solomon White, who who Saul White was not just a, a, a an executive; he was pre Negro League, uh, meaning you know prior to the 1920. And, and let me, let's, let's let me back up there, right? The um, the 1920 uh, Negro National League, along with six other Negro Leagues, were recognized recently by Major League Baseball as 
major league. Uh, right. So, I, so when oh, we're yeah. talking, so when we're talking pre Negro League, we're probably we're talking pre nineteen twenty. Right. I'm, 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 right. right. So, right. Um, so Saul White though he he was he played as well. He was he was not a bad ball player uh, either. So uh, it's uh, uh, what's what can you tell us about Saul White? Yeah, he he was uh, one of the early uh, players that 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 played. Um, in white baseball, um, even though the color line was drawn uh, prior to the beginning of the of the 20th century, um, there were some cracks in it, and there were about anywhere from eight to ten players who did play a, at the highest level in in, in white minor leagues. Or uh, if you go back to uh, uh, Fleetwood Walker, mm -hmm. who was considered the first African American to play. Uh, professional baseball. He played in the American Association, which at that time in the 1880s was considered uh, a professional league. Mm -hmm. And so Saul White was one of the guys who did play um, integrated baseball before the color, color line was solidly drawn. And then after that, he played with some of the earlier uh, good um, uh, African-American teams, one being the Philadelphia Giants. Who had, who at the turn of the century was one of the best teams in, in, in black baseball. Mm -hmm. And he also wrote a book about uh, blacks in baseball at that time. So uh, he, he was not only a, a player, but also a, a, an author. Awesome. Let's see. So next on my list. Okay. All right, so Ben Taylor, one of the uh, the many Taylor brothers yes. that uh, that played. There was uh, C.I. who was an owner player himself, right? right? right. There's Ben. Right. Was Ben Ben? Right. I think was he the oldest brother? I think of them all. Ben was the youngest. Ben was he the was youngest. the youngest. Okay, he, he was the youngest. Steel the youngest. arm, steel arm, Johnny is my favorite still. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was Candy Jim. Candy Jim, yeah. Right, right. And, and they all not only played. But they all followed C.I., who was the, uh, the okay. oldest. They also managed. They, they also managed. Now, Ben was, was the best player, and um, he played with the Indianapolis ABCs uh, prior to 19, the 1920s. Uh, and when the ABCs became part of the Negro National League, they were one of the first, the, the, uh, uh, first teams in the Negro National League. Ben, ben also played first base. And, but but after C.I. Taylor died, um, uh, I think 1923 or 24, uh, and then um, his wife took over the ABCs. There was a squabble between her yes. and Ben. And so Ben left and went over to the Eastern Colored League, where he became a, a, a manager over there. And the, the thing that a lot of people don't know about Ben, he pretty much founded Buck, Buck Leonard. And, and he taught Buck Leonard how to play first base. And a lot of people said, when you saw Buck Leonard, you saw Ben Taylor. And, and not only- He taught terms, him well. <laughs> yeah, and, but not only in terms of talent, but also in terms of uh, personality and uh, uh, character. And mm -hmm. so uh, when, when, when Buck Leonard was inducted into the Hall of Fame in his Hall of Fame, in his Hall of Fame speech, uh, he gave tribute to Ben Taylor. And so it is good that 2016, uh, doing 2006, 2006, the Taylor found his way into the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. You know, that, that's a, a really good point about a lot of these guys. Um, you know, um, we, we, I talked about this with Todd Peterson the other day. I mean, since so much of this involved um, barnstorming in between right. even league games when they were uh, set up, Right. Uh, they were going to all parts of the country everywhere. And, and, and on Twitter, I try every couple of days to pick, highlight a new part of the country and, and show what Negro League players and teams were there and, and, and get people to do a little bit of investigating. Because if you, if you look, there's probably not anywhere in North America, certainly, probably not in Central America either, that there weren't Negro League players or some footprint there. And, and one of the things, though, uh, like you mentioned with Ben Taylor, is their character and their personality. I mean, they, when they went to these towns, um, you know, they, they couldn't go there, uh, obviously, because of the, the social climate and so forth and, and behave. Uh, they had to be they behaved professionally. They had to be uh, 
at the top of their game because they wanted to come back. This is how they made their right. money. Right, right. Which, which is which is funny because this was during the time when when Major League Baseball was segregated mm -hmm. and 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 uh, didn't allow African American or dark skinned Latinos to play because they said that uh, the races couldn't play together. And this was at the major league, but in the my in, in the minor leagues and and during the barnstorming with the Negro League players, uh, the integration was 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 taking place, where a lot of these towns that did not um, could not see professional major league professional players, they didn't mind going out to see no. uh, the the local town team, see how they fared against um, Negro Negro League professional teams. So, so integration was going on at, at this level, but not at, at the major league level. Isn't that, isn't that funny, right? I mean, yes. I, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that wasn't true in some. You're going to find a lot of areas that were pretty hardcore uh, right, right, segregated, right? right? But for, you're, you're right. For the most part, even if there were these rules, right. unwritten or written, right. people didn't care. It was a game of baseball, right? right. I mean, this, this right. is. Uh, right. This is the the a game that everybody loved, and and it's what you know. Really, I mean, I, when you get right down to it, the impact of the Negro Leagues in that and in barnstorming to take the game to every corner of the country right. uh, is just uh, did so much for the game of baseball right. that people right. probably right. didn't even want to realize. <laughs> well, you know, also had to realize, you know, Major League Baseball was pretty much where there was no other team west of the Mississippi, you know, St. Louis was, was the end. And then you, most of the teams were concentrated up in the East coast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so a lot, a lot of the other uh, cities in the Midwest, they, their only uh, exposure to professional baseball, a lot of times was through Negro league teams. That's right. That's right. And they didn't care. Uh, they, they wanted to see a game of baseball. It didn't right, matter right, uh, right, the color right, of the right, skin. And they wanted to see the right. game. They wanted to see the game played. Right. That's right, exactly right. 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 And, and, right. and, uh, and you know, they had the, the, the Negro League circuit where uh, the Minarchs would meet uh, another Negro League team, you know, and they would have the circuit, whether it be Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, Little Rock, you know, uh, uh, Columbia, Missouri. You know, they, 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 went, they went around. They traveled. They really did. Like you said, they really traveled. They traveled. Yeah, and it, it was important to the growth of the game. And, and you know, they yes. talk today. They talk today about how, uh, you know, is the game losing uh, – are people losing interest in baseball? And, and you know, to some degree, um, because today's society is – you know, kind of instant gratification and, and other other things that have to do with it. Baseball is a little more cerebral, right? It's yeah. a little more thinking game. And so people like to see the home run and the strikeout. Right. And right. But in, a, in a way, it's making the game stale. I mean, if, if all you're doing up there at, during a baseball game is waiting for somebody to walk, strike out, or hit a home run, that's not the way the Negro Leagues played. No, 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 no. No, no. And it was an exciting brand of baseball that 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 people appreciated. And uh, I, I, maybe we need to go back. I mean, we probably need to go back to some degree. There's always got to be that happy medium. It, it can't be, I think, the way it is today. Uh, uh, the game is more exciting when everybody's in motion out there. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. All right. So the next pre-Negro League uh, – player was uh frank grant i'm not even that's something i guess that's his middle name is that where where did ulysses grant get his uh why do they call him frank well it was it was the list ulysses f grant frank grant frank was 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 his middle name okay and, and he was probably one of the best players in baseball uh, uh in 1880s and he, he he got he got as high in the International League and um, in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. That's where he played. And they, when they were still integrated at the time, right? Yeah, right. Yep. And and they, they tried to sign, they tried to say that he was from Spain. He was a Spaniard. They thought maybe that <laughs> ever tried to ease the pressure. They but, tried to uh, sneak that by on a few guys over the years. Yeah. That. But uh, you know, he um, he he was he was a three hundred hitter, but um, you know, they, they threw at him. Uh, he, he, he had to deal with verbal abuse, not only from his opponents, but some from, from his teammates. Uh, I think the second year he played, uh, some of the teammates refused to take pictures with him. And he, he, he was a second baseman. And 
it is said that because he, because he played, uh, it changed the way that players slid. Because before then, they, they slid head first, but they changed when they started to slide feet first because they were trying to spike Frank Grant. Uh, <laughs> they said that oh, man. players dropping their spikes. Did I read? Did I read somewhere that he had to actually wear like shin guards shin or something? Shin splints. They, were, they were shin splints. They were shin splints that they had. To, he had to put on his legs because the guys <laughs> in the second they, they tried to cut him up. Boy, and, oh boy! <laughs> and it got so bad that uh, they had, they had to put him out in the outfield. And um, you know he played uh, two years with with, with with Buffalo, the Bisons, and then they they refused to renew his contract. And that's when the the color line got solid, but then he left, and he and he he spent some years with the Cuban Giants, who uh, who get a lot of credit for being the first African American uh, professional black team, mm -hmm. uh, and so he, he played some years with with, with the Giants, and so um, I, I think based on uh, that, uh, I think that's what he, he, his credentials got him into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good point there, uh, you know, about the uh, length of time that these teams have been around and were playing and were accepted. And, and before 1920, that was not the first effort to it, it wasn't even the first effort by Rube Foster to start a league. He, he tried to start one, I think, uh, several years earlier, like around maybe 1912, 1914. But other leagues had been formed, but it none that really stuck until no. the 1920 Negro National League uh, right. came right. along. Right. All right. So the next, this is another one of my, uh, Pete Hill, another one of my favorite uh, all-time Negro League players, fantastic outfielder. I think his game was uh, uh, speed, defense, hit the gaps with the ball. Right, right, right. You know, um, a lot of times back then, uh, even though the, the white uh, um, sports writers, you know, they, they said it was a compliment, but they would always call um, – a, a Negro League player, yeah. the black this or the black that. Black Honus Wagner, whatever, right? Right, yeah. right, 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 <laughs> yeah. right, right, yeah. right. You know, and so Pete Hill was called the black Ty Cobb. Uh-huh. You know, because he, he, he hit for an average. He had the speed. Uh, he, he, he was a good outfielder. And basically, uh, with his induction into the Hall of Fame, so now when, when you talk about uh, the best outfielder pre-1920, uh, you know, they talk about Ty Cobb. They talk about try speaker, okay, but now, but now they also have to talk about Pete Hill. So he he he's in that conversation now. He's in that conversation now. Boy, you know, I I I'm glad you brought that up about the, uh, you know, the black Honus Wagner, the black, was right. was giant was Pop Lloyd, uh, right. you know, the right. the black Christy Matheson, and the, right. you know, right. Right. how how think about how crazy that is, right? I mean, what what if today we were saying that Mike Trout was the uh, was the white Willie Mays? I mean, it, it's it just doesn't make any sense no, to it, me. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. And, oh and it's, it's man! Interesting because <laughs> Honus Wagner always said that uh, he felt privileged and honored that that he, his name was associated with, with Pop Lloyd. So it's just you know, it, it, it's crazy. It, it, it makes no sense. These, these were baseball players, and and they all knew they all knew who the best yes. players were. They yes. all knew yes. that uh, when they right. took the field, whether it was an integrated game, a, a barnstorming game, a league game, right. who the best players were. And, uh, right. Anyway, right. yeah. So right. so the black Ty Cobb was Pete Hill. All right. 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 And then back back then also, uh, before um, uh, Judge Landis tried to stop it. You know, after the season, the barnstorming was the black players against some of the ma major league players. You know, because that that's why Rube Foster yes. yep. got his got his uh, nickname Rube because they said he outpitched Rube Wardell. Rube Wardell, yep. Right, right in, in, in one in one of the barnstorming games. So uh, that, interesting. Right, the white the white players knew that uh, the black players were equal. They, they did. Mm -hmm. they did. Now, that's that's a, that's an interesting topic. We talked a little bit about this the other day, but uh, the Kansas City Monarchs, uh, a good chunk of their team were the barnstorming all-nations team that uh, yeah. that came right. in. So f right. people were already, you know, geared up 
knowing that that was a, an integrated team that had, uh, you know, uh, all races, colors, you name it, was on All Nations, including including J.L. Wilkinson. He even played, I believe, uh, you know, in the early days of that team. And, and so uh, when they came to Kansas City and they were part of this league, I think Rube Foster probably knew that that was a uh, an important component to have in the league. Well, well, his initial uh, desire in, in starting Negro National League, one of them, was to try to wrestle uh, control of black baseball from uh, from white owners, from from, from, yeah. from white owners, and especially uh, the, the white. The, and I'm I'm forgetting the name of it. The promoters, because they were the, the white the white promoters. They uh, own or had control of the fields, you know, they, got, they, they took they, their they, cuts. Right. They had, <laughs> they had to get their cuts. So mm-hmm. he was trying to, he was trying to get that away from, from them, but, but he couldn't leave out J.L. Wilkinson because Wilkinson not only had the mine arts, but he also had the lease for the stadium here, right. here in Kansas City. So he, he had to include the mine arts and, and, and it was, and in the end, it was a good thing for Foster because a Wilkinson, uh, Helped him. Uh, he was he was a vice president of the league, and he was a big help for Foster in in in, in those initial uh, years for the Negro National League. Isn't that what it all always comes down to in so many things, right? Show me the money, and that's yes. that's that's yes. kind of where it has to go, right? Yes. Um, you know the um, uh, like you mentioned with the the promoters taking the cut because yes. they controlled the venues, right? Yes. So so you had <clears throat> such a, a a mix of 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 um, sections of all this this puzzle. You had the players themselves who they want to get paid, right? They want to which is why they resorted many times to go in barnstorming because they can make a little bit more money that way. But um, then you had the promoters and then the owners and everybody's got to uh, to uh, uh, survive and, and, and make money and pay the bills. But you're right, Rube Foster realizing that, um, you know, if you really wanted to get your, your hands around this, you had to control um, that piece of it, the, 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 uh, the scheduling and the right. stadiums and so forth, because it, right. right. it was a big right. chunk, I'm sure. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know if anybody knows any of those numbers as far as what, well, uh, was, it, what the cuts were. But... About 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent, okay, went to um, the, the promoters. And, and that, you know, that was the, um, that was the sticking point or, of Negro League Baseball through the entire through this entire its entire run, mm-hmm. that the owners never owned uh, their stadium. Other other than Gr- Gus Greenlee, who had the the, the, the Pittsburgh um, uh, Crawfords, because you know, he, 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 he built his own. He went and built his own, own right? Right, <laughs> yeah. right, 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 right. right. Yep. And, and then um, one of the guys that I, that, that that that's that's in the book, um, he he uh, he was Wait. owner of the New York Cubans. And he he controlled his, the stadium up in New York for 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 for, for a while, but those, those those were the only two. But when you have to spend twenty percent of what you make to for the rental, mm-hmm. it, was, it was always an economic. It always caused economic burden on Negro League players. Sure, and and they they knew those promoters. I'm sure they they knew they held all the cards, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. where else are they going to go? They're yeah. going to go play in. Uh, right. Right. Go play right. where? If they want the crowds to be able to fit into a ballpark, right. Uh, right. they they had all the cards, right? right? And that's also what we were talking about in terms of scheduling. You know, that made scheduling very very difficult sure. for for the Negro League team, for the Negro National League team, because you you would you were trying you had to play when the park was available, okay. And then the other thing in terms of the, the economics of the Negro League team. Uh, the more games you played, the more money you made. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you had to choose between, you know, playing a league game or maybe playing a a a, a non-league game against a semi-professional team that was going to generate more money for you. Right. So, uh, you know, one 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 of the courses that I that I that I taught and and, and I'm going to teach again this summer was was called. Um, uh, the Negro National League 
uh, an 11-year journey through the stormy seas of professional baseball. You Where's know, that? Where, where are you going to teach that at? Okay, uh, I'm going to teach that at um, uh, the Wichita Public Library on um, August the 3rd. It, it's, it's a virtual, it's, it's a virtual okay. uh, a class. It's a virtual class. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, Rube Foster, when he started the Negro National League, he, he said, we are the ship, everything else is the sea. Mm -hmm. that, 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 was his, that was his motto. And that was basically what he was talking about. He was trying to uh, navigate the league through the stormy seas of, of professional baseball because they, they had all of these things that they had to deal with. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of economic <clears throat> problems and was caused by racism. Um, you know, uh, the, the um, African-American press, you know, which had a relationship with the Negro League teams, uh, there was always a contention between them because the press always wanted the Negro Leagues to operate like the major leagues, you know, like the 154 game schedule. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and always having a, a, a pennant race, you know, but because of the economic dynamics of, of the Negro Leagues, uh, that never uh, was something that they were able to do. That's absolutely right. And then it's, it's something that um, in the context, right? everything is context. You, 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 uh, you, you t hit on that exactly. I mean, in order to understand all of this and the dynamics that went into it, you, you have to understand the context of the time period and the, and the right. finances and, right. and the personalities, because otherwise, you know, it, it's real easy to say exactly what, you know, what you were just saying the press was saying. Hey, why aren't they playing a 154 game right. schedule? Well, right. Right. It's, right. it's hard. <laughs> right. They also you have to look look at the fan base for the Negro League teams. You know, African Americans economically were on the lower scale. You know, a, a, a lot of most of them didn't have the additional money to entertainment in terms mm -hmm. of going to going to games. You know that that's why, uh, in terms of Negro League teams, the weekends were the most profitable. Because uh, you know, people were able to save their money and go to maybe a weekend game, where maybe during the week they, they weren't able to do that. So uh, I think, that, 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 that was another thing that they had to deal with. I think about that dynamic too, right? They were playing a lot of these games, uh, like we talked about, in 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 all sorts of corners of the country, um, oh. many of whom were predominantly white, right? But they went there and they played, and and the product that they put on the field, I would think they had to be a little bit cautious, right? Because if they went to, let's say someplace up in, you know, Iowa, I don't know, just pick, pick a place and, and they beat the stuffing out of a, out of a local team. Maybe they're not invited back. I, I don't yeah, know. They, you know, they, they knew when to step on the accelerator. And when I would they, think you did. Yes. They, they knew they they knew when they had to, um, um, you know, uh, put the pressure on or back on, you know, so they, they understood that. They and that's a, what's it come down to simple economics, right? They know <laughs> that if right. they, uh, if they, right. if they don't, you know, take it easy a little bit, maybe here or there, then, right. uh, that's costing them money in the long run. So, right. yeah. Right. So, so, uh, on Thursday night, I'm going to have on uh, artist uh, Greg Kreindler, who to me, I don't know if you've seen his work, but he, he blows me away. Some of his paintings are in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. He's he's now, the one he, he's the one who he, did the he card set. The, he was did, he the one that did the, the drawings for yes. that were going to be part of the uh, centennial. Uh, yes, he did okay. this. Uh, right. He he did this right. card set right here that right. Uh, is 184 cards of just an incredible stuff. But this player right here is, is he has said is, is one of his favorites, if not his favorite, uh, Jose Mendez, uh, the black diamond. Right. Right. He put, he was with the minors. He, he was, he, he was, was a manager, manager and, and, and manager yes. For, for the, for the minor, right? <laughs> oh boy, you know, yeah, he was with the monarchs, right. But think about what he was doing, right. He was manager. He was probably, I think he played shortstop. He played other right. positions. Right. He was pitcher. Right. Uh, right. They don't right. do that today. <laughs> no, no. And, and he was at the, he was at sort of the end of his, his career mm -hmm. because he, he first got his name 
uh, pitching down in Cuba. When when the major league teams would go to Cuba in, in the winter to play, uh, and I think he he made he pitched like twenty something straight innings, uh, shut out against the Cincinnati Reds. So that, uh-huh. that that's where that's where he got his name. And then also he played for All Nations for yes. GL, GL Wilkinson. So by so by the time he became manager of the the Monarchs, uh, his arm was pretty much gone, and he mm-hmm. played shortstop. However, he pitched the deciding game in the 1924 World Series, the Black World Series, Negro League World Series, where the Monarchs uh, defeated Hilldale. So uh, that, 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 that was, you know, when, when they asked him who was going to pitch the deciding game, he said he was. And he, 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 he won the thing. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he's a fascinating uh, yeah. example of, uh, uh, of all this because the major league players were, they knew him. They knew him for many, many years. Right. Uh, right. They knew his capabilities, but there was right. no way he was getting into the major leagues because of no. the no. way he looked. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. And he, had, he, had, he had the these long fingers. I, I read that he had the long fingers where he was able to control the baseball. And if you would compare to him to any contemporary, they said he was maybe close to Pedro Martinez. That's where they, huh. uh, they That's said. a good analogy. Yeah. Interesting. I could see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So the next, now here's a guy who's like Mendez, who kind of, uh, he, he's considered on the list for 2006 as pre-Negro League because his, you know, he, he began then, but, but he, he spanned into the Negro National League as, or into that era as well. Louis Santop. Yes, 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 yes. He, uh, he was a catcher. And it, what's interesting is that he was part during that time uh, of a group, Negro League players that came out of Texas. Uh, um, Santop, um, uh, um, some, some some others who were who were born and raised in Texas. Okay, mm-hmm. and, so, and so he was part of the, the the Texas group. And at that time, he was considered one, a power hitter in, in terms of Negro League baseball. Smokey, right. Smokey Joe right. Williams. Smokey Joe right. Williams they, they is one are, of those they, guys. They, he's from not they, too far from me. He's he's right, from Se- right, Seguin. Right, right. He's not too far right, from right, me at all. Yeah. Right. Biz Mackey, Biz Mackey came mm-hmm. from near from near San Antonio, mm-hmm. and Andy Cooper came from 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 near Waco. Oh wow! Um, okay, that's right. I yeah, forgot about yeah, him. He's so, another yeah, one that's in this list. Right, yes. right, right, right. So they 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 they, they came from Texas, and uh, Santop was um, he was a catcher, but he was a better hitter than than he was uh, uh, than he caught, and. Um, Prior to the 1920s, you know, that's where he, he got the reputation of being a, a home run hitter. And then he blended in until uh, the Negro, when the Negro Leagues were formed, playing for Hilldale in, in the Eastern Colored League. And he was, I wouldn't say he was a goat, but he, he dropped a, he dropped a, a foul pop-up uh, that allowed the Fine Arts to win a game in, in that 1924 a World Series, and that helped them eventually become the, the World Series champion that year. Interesting, you know, you look at you look at these plaques, and you see um, they list some of the teams. Like for example, um, he's listed as with the Lincoln Giants, the Royal yes. Giants, Hilldale. Yeah. Uh, yes. He all, we know he was on you know probably other teams as well. Many of these guys were the same way, and and it all comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Economics. Yeah, <laughs> it, there were no long-term contracts with these no, guys. They went no. where the money was. Yes, no. that, and that's what Pop Lloyd said. Pop Lloyd said he went where the money, where the money was. That, that's exactly what he and, said. You know, Santop was was a battery for Smokey Joe Williams. You mentioned mm-hmm. uh, a, a few minutes a few minutes ago. He was a battery for Smokey Joe Williams, mm-hmm. and he was a battery for Cannonball. Cannibal uh, Redding, yeah. Yeah, he was also a, a bad remake for him. Right, right. Awesome, yeah. I mean, the the uh, uh, the caliber of these players, um, I, I, I just, it, it, it's always so fun to go back and revisit these guys and talk about yeah. them because yeah. this was a yeah. guy, I mean, I think if you had to uh, 
you know, Louis Santop um, as catchers go. He's left-handed hitter, right? Or was he a switch hitter? I don't remember if he was. I a... think he was, just, he was right. He was right. He was, was he? Right okay. Yeah. So he. Uh... Right. But the other, the other thing you, 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 you have to think about is these were the guys who stuck with it. Okay. Uh, just think that there may have been some other some other guys who who maybe had the talent but did not want to make the the commitment of, of sticking with it because they saw you know the racism involved and you know so there, there there could there could be some 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 players who had the talent but decided maybe to choose their family rather than the the, the, the lifestyle that some of these Negro League players um, the travel because, because of their love for the game because of their love for the game I mean so, look uh, at the travel right these guys weren't yes. playing just uh, uh, you know uh, I mean baseball is a long season to begin with it's a marathon every single season but these guys were playing 300 and some days out of the year if, or traveling yes. uh, yes. yeah it would be kind of hard to have a family I would think yes. if you, yes. if you, yes. uh, yes. if you uh, were so inclined because yes. uh, you just weren't yes. home <laughs> yeah, so so there there may be there may have been some guys who had the talent, but they just decided, well, you know, we we just you know not going to play in the major leagues, and you didn't want the you know the life of a Negro League player, so they just didn't didn't play. Mm -hmm. didn't play. All right, so now we're going to move into the Negro League players. Okay, four or five of them. So the first one, I I love the story behind the nickname of uh, of Bud Judd Wilson. Um, I had heard where uh, he used to hit balls, line drives up the wall so hard yes, that that was yes. the noise it made. But Right, right. That's <laughs> I right. love that. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But you know, the the other thing about Wilson, one of the um, one of the things that they complained about Negro League baseball was was the lack of discipline. Yeah. And um, and, and that. Um, the umpires, uh, the, the players abused the umpires. You know, it was said that umpires uh, carried weapons, carried guns, <laughs> because they were afraid of the players, because the, the owners so, would not back the, the, the umpires in terms of disputes or something like that. And so uh, they, they would say that Judd Wilson was the poster boy for uh, abusing umpires. And did he become, he, did he become the... Uh, uh, I, I like you're saying the the poster of what all black players were probably right because they wanted to paint them as a certain way that they're you know. it was it, it, it was a, st a stereotype in terms mm -hmm. of the lack of discipline and there probably okay. were a few a few players like him but oh, I don't yeah. think that was yeah. the majority of them no, were not no, like no, that no. Right? no 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 yeah. no 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 Wil Wilson Wilson was 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 the extreme he um. And he he would get so angry he would follow the umpires into uh, the locker room and uh, you know th there were instances where he he swung and you know he, he tried to hit umpires and then of course there, there there's also the and, and, you, and that's the other thing about Negro Negro League baseball there's, there's the Negro League baseball lore and you know well with fifty percent is probably true fifty percent is probably it's myth yeah it's myth but but, but there's a story. Of, of a Negro League, the Negro League uh, All-Star game in Chicago, and Judd Wilson and Jed Stevens, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, Stevens, who was a short, uh, shortstop, were roommates. And so um, Stevens came in late uh, and woke um, Wilson up. And the story has it that Wilson got so angry that he, he grabbed him and, and held him out the window by his side. <laughs> By his legs for, for a couple of minutes before before bringing him back in. It was Jake Stevens. It was Jake Stevens. That's, that, country that's country me. Jake Stevens. Yeah, country I remember Jake, that. That's that's awesome. Yeah. But 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 Wilt, yeah, Wilson had had a temper, but he was he was a, he was a good player, and um, he played a for, long time. Uh, yeah, yeah, he played for a long time, and then then he played for the Homestead Grades. Mm -hmm. During that period, where they where they won the seven or eight uh, 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 pennants mm -hmm. in terms of, of the Negro National League, these guys. What's what's so fun about these? Not just even the stories, but they uh, 
uh, these guys were were good athletes. Many yeah. of them pitched and played the field somewhere and played many positions on the field. And, right. and, and part right. of that was necessity, right? You're only carrying right. a dozen right. guys on the roster, right? Right. It's so small, right. That's true. That, and that's, and that's because there just isn't enough money to go around for more than that. That's right. that's exactly <laughs> so it all right. comes down. To, it all comes down to money, right? That's true. Yeah. All right. Here's another one of my favorite uh, uh, players, uh, Cristobal Torriente, another Rube Foster's uh, uh, part of that Chicago American Giant powerhouse team that yes. Rube Foster had. Right, right, right. and then and he 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 is had, was voted as probably one of the best outfielders. In Negro League baseball history, he was uh, he was a power hitter, uh, a, a left a left-handed hitter, um, and the rumor was, I don't know how true it was, but the the rumor, you know, there were there were some light-skinned Hispanics, Cubans, mm -hmm. that uh, played in, in 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 Major League Baseball. A number of them, yes, yes, a number, a number of them did, right? Mm -hmm. and so um, Major League teams looked were were, were interested in, in Torrente. But the story was that his hair was too kinky. His hair wasn't straight enough. And so that, therefore he wasn't gonna be able to pass. Um, oh boy. And, yeah, and, and the, and the other, other thing about him, you know, uh, there have been organizations who have gone around looking for uh, the uh, graves of Negro League players that, that have not had a uh, uh, headstone. Mm -hmm. and, and, right, and, and they've made headstones for them. Um, it had been thought that uh, Torrente, who had a, who was uh, had uh, bad problems with drinking, he was an alcoholic. It was it was thought that after he quit playing, that he went back to Cuba, but it was found out that um, he went to New York and basically lived in destitution. Hmm. And when he died, um, you know, they buried him in a city lot, or and, and so. I, I, I think what happened was they finally found his his grave, and they actually finally put a headstone on on, on it. So number uh, of guys like that. That was yes, I mean yes, uh, the yes. Donaldson network. Didn't they, they did that with John Donaldson? I mean think of a guy like John Donaldson who not only not only was a a, uh, a nationally known internationally in Canada as well and uh, baseball player, but. Um, then he went on and scouted in, in the major leagues for the White yeah. Sox, and, and yeah. he winds up in an unmarked grave. How, I mean, how is that possible? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, that, that goes back to what we were talking about in terms of the, the, the lifestyle that they led maybe alienated them from family. And so... Um, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, so that, that, may have been, that may have been a situation. We, you know, that, that's something we don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're trying to find out, you know, with uh, with that's all true. of this research yeah. and digging to find out what's going on. Uh, here's a here's another personality of uh, another uh, uh, of the Negro League players inducted, uh, Mule Suttles. Yes, yes, yes. That he was a power hitter. He he was a power hitter, and um, the when he came to bat, you know, the, the fans would holler, "Kick Mule, kick Mule." <laughs> <laughs> because they, they, you know he um, he he swung a heavy bat and uh, a lot of times he missed, but when he connected, he, it went. Uh, it went. You know, <laughs> it, it, it was said that uh, Josh Gibson hits more home runs than Mule Suttles, but Mules w were the ones that were the the tape measure shot. Uh, a, a, another myth was that uh, he hit a home run in Cuba that that wound up in, in the ocean. Uh, because it went over uh, out of the stadium, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, over where there, there was some uh, military people, and it wound up in, in, in the sea. You know, so uh, I don't doubt it. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's there's several uh, former yeah. Major League Baseball players that uh, I kind of uh, keep in touch with, follow um, that are retired. They're into coaching, doing other things, and and. The discussion of today's game versus the game of the past, and it's all context, right? I mean, today you have players who pitchers throwing, you know, 100 miles an hour consistently, with, you know, be able to spin the ball like no, no, no other time. Uh, right. uh, players are great physical shape, but at the same time, they're not playing in stadiums like Mule Suttles did. 
uh, right. that had 500 feet to dead center. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, right. some of right. the stadiums that these guys were hitting home runs in, uh, right. you know, back in those days were caverns. They were, they were right. enormous, not like today. today. Right. And, and another thing, which gets back to the economics that, that we were talking about, uh, in the Negro Leagues, um, the spitball was not banned. Uh, you know, oh. pitches, pitches could doctor up the balls. Uh, and then also because they were trying to save uh, money on balls, if a ball was uh, fouled off or they used it, whatever, they, they threw it back, threw it back into play. <laughs> and you know what pitchers could do with a nick ball or something like you know, or, sure. or a ball that was scuffed up, you know. So and and so that's what Negro League hitters had to deal with. So that that was very difficult. Very absolutely, very difficult. absolutely, yeah. yeah it, Context. It's all about context. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, yeah. when you look at some of these players. All right. What we got next here? We have uh, coming down to the end. Ray Brown, fantastic pitcher, was on those same Homestead Gray uh, yeah. teams that we were talking about. Yeah, and 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 Ray, Ray Raymond Brown suffered from what a lot of Negro League pitchers suffered from, and that was the image of Satchel Page, because uh, Satchel Page out, you know. In terms of his personality and and, and overshadowing, they, yeah, and overshadowed all of them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Raymond Brown, uh, Leon Day, uh, you know, and, and there were there were many others. He, of course, Hilton Smith. You know, uh, mm -hmm. they were, they were just overshadowed by by, by Satchel Page and and Ray, Raymond Brown. I would compare him, say, to uh, maybe like a Whitey Ford. You mm -hmm. know, because Whitey Ford's talent was never really you know. Um, uh, given as much talent or, uh, or appreciation as it should have been because he was the Yankees. Mm -hmm. and, and the Yankees, the Yankees always won. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, they scored runs for him. So Raymond Brown, he, he faced the same situation because of, because of the Grays. You know, so the, the, the Grays got all the, the, the recognition, whereas his talent probably was not recognized as the way it should. Now, another thing about these guys, too, and I think Ray Brown was a good example of it, um, many of them think again context right so you got mm -hmm. the, the Negro National League comes along several other Negro Leagues come along the whole aspect of, of economics and finances of how to make that all work you've got the Major League still playing now along come leagues in the Dominican Republic and Mexico yes. and, yeah. and there already were leagues in Cuba so a lot of these guys used to leave and go play in, in, in these other leagues Right. Uh, and drop out of the Negro Leagues for, for years uh, right. or, or right. good chunks of them, right? Yeah. Well, like Ray Dandridge, you know, and and the thing about going to Mexico, the thing they, they said, yeah. because they, they like to go to Who Mexico. could blame them? <laughs> right, right. They didn't yeah. have to deal with racial prejudice. That's, that's right. That's, Where you're not treated like a second class citizen. That's right. Why would you, right. why would you not want to go there? <laughs> If they're paying you and you can that's have correct. the same exact, uh, uh, you know, standard of living and you don't have to deal with all of that. Yeah. That's true. Uh, why would you not go? Right. right. <laughs> all right. So now there's Lefty Cooper. He was a monarch as well. Right. In his career. Yes. 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 He was he was what they would call, you know, the, the crafty left hander. You know, he, he didn't have the name like Smokey Joe Williams or some of the other power uh, pitchers, he, mm -hmm. you know, but he, he, he kept, he kept batters off balance, you know, uh, with curveball, slider or, or whatever. And um, he, he was a star pitcher for the, for the Detroit stars. And then after he left there, he, he became um, manager for the Monarchs. And he was, he was the manager of the Monarchs when they won those initial uh, Negro uh, American league titles. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing, he died. He died early in terms of uh, his age, and um, that was he was he was also the manager that was with the Monarchs when Buck O'Neill came up. Oh, so, uh, okay. A lot, a lot of the managerial skills uh, that Buck O'Neill had, he got from Andy Cooper. So awesome. well, that, you know that he was important. He was important. So there's there's that uh, there's that context again, right? I mean, he he had a number of pitches. He threw them at different speeds. He yes, probably had right, that ch right, change up right. off a change up off a change right, up, like right, uh, right. you know, I can't remember if it was Warren Spahn or Johnny Sane who said his best pitch was his change up 
office right. change up, right. office change up kind of thing. But why was that? Right? You 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 had uh, less pitchers. You had to pitch the entire game. Uh, oh. You had to go pitch again tomorrow, probably. Maybe oh. there was a doubleheader the day after that, and you were pitching again. And in between, you were playing left field or center field oh. or wherever. Um, yeah. This was a different game, and and uh, man, you know, all my all credit to these guys to uh, to uh, not only perform at the level they did, but but also um, you know outside right. the ballpark what they right. had to deal with. So right, right. And then you also the, there was not enough money for a quote quote trainer. No. So, so a lot you know you played when you when you were hurt, okay, and and a lot of the uh, remedies that you use were probably homespun remedies that 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 that, that they use, but um, they, they kept playing. And the, the other thing is that you kept playing because, you know, if you didn't, um, somebody else could come in and take take your place. So it, that got, got back down to economics that we were talking about. Absolutely, it it just drives everything, and and mm-hmm. uh, it, it's 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 the context. You've got to understand. Uh, what was behind the scenes that that right. uh, it's it's not as simple as this guy hit 300 for his career with 300 home right. runs it, it's not that simple uh, right. to and, right. and you've got to put it into the bigger picture and it's it's like a big puzzle really I mean I think it's uh, it's fascinating right. stuff right uh, and then and then the other thing is that we have to watch because I think sometimes uh, w- with some of the um, as we were talking about the, the the myths about Negro League baseball, the Negro League baseball lore, sometimes we may glamorize it when we shouldn't be when it shouldn't shouldn't be glamorized because the first thing you have to realize that was because it was because of segregation. Yes. That was the reason that that is that it existed. Simple, plain and simple. Right. That's right. what it was. Right. Yeah. right, and and it was not an easy life. You know the you know the bingo. Uh, big bingo long all stars movie that that that, that, that was out. Yeah, they haven't been out. They have been a lot. Of, yeah. Right, right. They haven't been a lot of movies mm-hmm. about New York baseball. And there the needs reality, there needs to be needs more. To, right, <laughs> you know, the reality of it because it was not easy. It was not easy at all. No, it was not. Now here's here's the only player in this entire group of seventeen people that actually played in the major leagues, and it was very very briefly at the end of his career. But Willard Brown. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that uh, in 1947, uh, you know, Jackie Robinson broke across uh, broke the uh, invisible color line. Okay, mm-hmm. first play in the National League. Then the you know Larry Doby came along. Mm-hmm. Okay, first in the American League in 1947. But um, a lot of people don't realize that there were two others. There was Willard Brown. Okay, um, and then. Um, there was also his name is skipping me right now, but uh, but, but Willard but, but Willard Brown he was mm-hmm. with the Minors, and you know the St. Louis Browns they saw how the, the crowds were following Jackie Robinson, and so um, they they had an idea that we, well maybe we're going to sign some black players and maybe the crowds would follow us, but the Browns at that time were the worst franchise in baseball. <laughs> uh, they could barely sometimes get over 200 people to come out uh, to, to games. And so mm-hmm. they, they signed Willard Brown. And, and at that time, Willard Brown was, he was the, uh, the number one home run hitter in the Negro Leagues in the 1940s after Josh Gibson started declining. And he was, he was a definitely what they call a five two player. He had the speed, he could throw, he could hit home runs. He could hit, and he could he could hit for that, with average, and he was an excellent fielder. So, but he was leaning toward the end of his career. So they signed him, and they signed Hank Thompson. Okay, and so, yes. but 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 the you know the experiment didn't work. You know, everybody realized they just signed him to try to you know bring in bring in fans, and then after they signed him, they didn't play him. Oh they, no, they, they sat him on the bench. You know, so they, they wound up releasing them before they had to pay them. And, you know, Brown went back to the Minarchs and later went on to integrate uh, the Texas League. But in the, he never got another chance 
in 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 in, in the major leagues. But Hank Thompson was young enough mm-hmm. so that when he went back to the, the Minarchs, that the New York Giants signed him, and he went on and had a, a pretty decent uh, a major league career. Mm-hmm. Well, it's too bad. I mean, you think of the careers that that That's were cool. lost yeah. here uh, through all this nonsense that was uh, going on back then. Right. right. So so with with the uh, addition now. The, you know, with with the, with the Negro National League finally being recognized as a major league, okay, mm-hmm. and so they're gonna they're gonna go back and look at some of the league games since nineteen mm-hmm. since nineteen twenty, and include some of those statistics. So, mm-hmm. you know, Willard Brown was the first African American to hit a home run in American League. He he had an inside the park home run in, in Yankee Stadium that year that the brief time that he played. So, Interesting. Right. I'm sure that there'll be additional home runs added to his major, his stats mm-hmm. once they do the research. Awesome. Uh, here's another uh, one of my favorites, another catcher, Biz Mackey. I think he's the last right. player on the list, but uh, is it, was it Biz or Buzz? It was Biz. It was Ra- because, Raleigh, Biz Mac- Raleigh Biz Mackey. Where's that? Where does what's Biz come from? Where does it come? You know from? what? I, I I I I haven't in my research found out yet. <laughs> you know, I, I know I know he's from near San Antonio, okay, and and I know he when he came up he came up with the Indianapolis ABCs because uh, C.I. Taylor had a connection with 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 with, with some of the own with some of the managers. In, in, in Texas, that and so he brought Biz Mackey up. Uh, Mackey's uh, he's known for his defensive uh, prowess, but when he first came up, he was also a good hitter. And 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 so uh, you know his his claim to fame, of course, is that he taught Roy Campanella how to uh, how to catch. He, awesome. he was Roy Camp he was Roy Campanella's mentor. Awesome. And when yeah, you know when and when they had the um, Appreciation for Roy Campanella in 1959 out at uh, well at, at that time it was not Dodger Stadium it was the Coliseum in Los Angeles mm-hmm. where Biz Mackey got some recognition. Cool. All right, so now we're into the last couple the uh, the okay. Negro League executives that came in. So here's Alex Pompez, who his his contributions I think most people don't are not going to know too much about, but were pretty uh, significant when it came yeah. to uh, right. the right. Negro Leagues. Right, right. And, and the other thing about him is that um, uh, the knock against Negro League baseball, especially during the 1930s, okay, during the Depression, all right, when nobody in, in the Black community had any money, all right, most of the Negro League teams were financed by the numbers kings, the guy that the guys mm-hmm. that ran the illegal uh, gambling is mm-hmm. right, right, right. And yep. Pompeius, Pompeius was the king in, in Harlem. Uh, he he was he was so successful that the the mobster Dutch Dutch, Dutch Schultz took over his his um, his his numbers operation, <laughs> and, and and they tried to get Pompeius to testify against. Uh, the, the mob, the mob in New York, and he he fled. He fled the country, but but the, the, but they caught him, and he finally came back, and and he did testify. Luckily, by by the time he came back, came back, Dutch Schultz had been murdered. Was, <laughs> and, and, and was dead, but he did testify, and he's one of the few people who testified against against the mafia and survived. But 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 he after he testified he got out of that that and went back into Negro League baseball, and he always said that uh, Negro League baseball was a lot safer occupation than, um, than dealing with the mob and the gambling. Right, yeah. dealing with the mob, right. <laughs> and, and the other yeah. thing about Pompez is that uh, he saw the writing on the wall uh, in terms of integration, and so um, after integration he became a scout for the Caribbean, for the, for the uh, New York slash San Francisco Giants. Mm-hmm. And he, he signed Orlando Cepeda and, and the Lou boys for the, uh, for the, for the Giants. Awesome. And, and Juan Marshall. Yeah, and Juan Marshall. How can I forget that? <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, Composey, another significant uh, uh, owner 
back from that time period as well. I think didn't he have a little bit of uh, that same uh, that same backing like like yes, Pompez? Yes. Right, right. He was uh, he was of course the um, you know the, the owner of the Homestead Grays, mm -hmm. and there uh, so many Negro League players in their career at one time or other uh, wore uh, the Homestead Grays uniform. You mm -hmm. know, they, they play, play for the Grays. And even though Homestead is, you know, right across the river from Pittsburgh, uh, he, he saw that there was there was a potential for Washington, D.C. So that's why wow. he moved the Grays to Washington, D.C. In, in, in 1942. And, and, and yes, um, in the early 30s, uh, Gus Greenlee, who was o owner of the Pittsburgh Crawfords, uh, yes. Crawford, signed most of, of the Homestead Grace players from Composi. And uh, it, was, it was a tough time for him. So what, basically what he did, he got the, the, the numbers king uh, guy out of Homestead, Homestead, and a guy by the name of Sonny Jackson to, um, to, to finance the Grace. Mm -hmm. And, and w one story, I don't know how true it is, you know, uh, Greenlee had, had uh, gotten uh, Josh Gibson from, from the Grays. And the story was that Greenlee had a gambling debt that, 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 that Sonny Jackson paid. And, and in return, what happened, uh, he sent Josh Gibson back to the Homestead <laughs> Grays at, after that. So, Show yeah, me the yeah. money. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah, that's right. All yeah. right, so here's one of, of the significant owners that we've already talked a little bit about him, but uh, J.L. Wilkinson, um, right. who uh, right. has a yeah. hand in so much with the early uh, teams and, and uh, leagues of the Negro Leagues. Yeah, I, I mean, it's surprising that he had not been in the Hall of Fame uh, prior, prior to that because um, – uh, he, he's the father of night baseball. He he, he basically so many say, things. Yes, say baseball, um, because he realized something, something the major leagues didn't do till years oh, later. That's right. That's <laughs> Play right. at night. Yes, that's right. He he his, think, his thinking was so far ahead of major league baseball in terms of integration of players, in terms of uh, promotion. You know, uh, ladies, ladies' day, and all other other types of promotions that that would try to attract uh, uh, fans to the game. And then, of course, uh, night, night baseball. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm surprised he wasn't inducted to the Hall of Fame prior to that. Just the accomplishments, I know, alone <laughs> are incredible. Yes, and 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 the, and the Monarchs players loved him. Mm -hmm. they, they, they loved him. He traveled with them. Really, you know, that's interesting. And, right, and if there was a town that that said that um, they could play, but they can't eat, uh, he would not go there. So uh, he, uh, he 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 loved his the players loved him. They he, he that's how to, that's he how that's to, being a leader, right? Yes, 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 yes. He mm -hmm. gave them advances on their salary, he loaned the money. So you know, and of course, he saved the career of Satchel Page. Well, a lot of people didn't realize that Paige's arm went dead um, in the early 40s. Uh, and so uh, Wilkinson brought signed him and he, he, he developed this team called the Satchel Paige All-Stars, mm -hmm. which was basically a B team for the Monarchs. And they barnstormed and people would come out to see Satchel Paige. Now, Paige's arm was sore. He only pitched maybe one inning, <sighs> but... Uh, that's that's what drew people out, mm -hmm. and miraculously, uh, Page's arm uh, 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 healed, and, and um, wound up in the he, majors. Right, right, right. <laughs> he was he was fascinating. The only, right, he was the only. Uh, Wilkinson was the only uh, owner that Page gave any loyalty to, which, mm -hmm. which, which was something unusual. Something right, yeah, because he played on a lot of different teams and right. a lot of different right. countries. <laughs> Right, that's true. That's true. That's true. And last but not least, who you started this whole thing off with was uh, the only woman in the Hall of Fame, Effa Manley. Yes, that's right. She 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 ran the Newark Eagles. She um, you know uh, was the business manager. She hired she hired the managers, and it was even said that um, she gave signals 
from the stands uh, to, 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 to the players. And <laughs> she was the, really the only one um, st- with integration who stood up to, to Branch Rickey's and, and the, and the Bill, Bill Vex. Cause you know, cause Ricky didn't pay anything for Jackie Robinson. Mm-hmm. All right? But, uh, but after that, um, they, they had oh, to start, they had to start paying for the players because of Effa Manley. Nice. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Dodgers wanted Monty Irving, mm-hmm. but Branch Ricky did not want to deal with Effa Manley. So, uh, he wound up uh, on the Giants. Yeah. He, he wound up on the Giants. And, and of course, Bill Vec, he, he paid Effa Manley for Larry Doby. Okay. And so um, Mrs. Matt, she was she was tough, she, and she never she never forgave Branch Ricky for, uh, for stealing that <laughs> nuclear. Now, uh, the, eventually, the Newark Eagles came here to Houston, where I where I yes, am. Did. Did, she was sold, she was she, she sold, already right. out? She was already yeah, out of that, sold, right? Yeah, she sold she sold him in 1948 to 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 uh, a, 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 an owner in Houston, and they became the Houston. Eagles, right? And you know, and and after the demise of the Negro National League, I think the Eagles, they stayed in the Negro American League for a few years. Yes, that's right. That's right. right. Um, so that was great. I mean, that was your uh, the highlight of all of the players that are in your book, Last Train to Cooperstown, and uh, it it uh, it's a fascinating uh, subject, a fascinating read. I I think it's. Uh, uh, it's great and and hard to believe it's 15 years ago already. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and... <laughs> right, right. Well, of course, I'm 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 in the process of putting together a second edition because I've learned so much information, you know, about about those 17 people uh, since since I put the book out. So, he, well, so that's n- that was my book. next that was my next question. So so what uh, what what are you working on now? What's coming next? Okay. Uh, All right, I got I'm, you back on here. All right. right. I'm, wor- I'm working. I'm working on a second edition of, of my book, and then also I'm like like I said, I'm working on these the classes that are coming up. Um, the um, the Negro League, na- the Negro National League class. I'm going to be doing for the Wichita Public Library, and then for uh, in July for the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute. I'm going to be doing a class called Baseball Goes to War. Uh, World War II and the National Pastime. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave the okay, not only the Major League Baseball, but also the Negro League Baseball to continue to play during the war to um, to keep morale of the home front. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's interesting that where Major League Baseball, uh, a, a lot of the talent level was drained because of the guys going... Sure. To, to, to World War II and to fight in the war. Mm-hmm. However, there were some Negro League players for some reason that were 4F. And, but, you know, Major Leagues never, you know, attempted to try to sign them. And, um, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people realize that Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams, Hank Greenberg, they all served in the, in the, in the Army. But mm-hmm. also, Bonnie Irving, uh, Larry Doby, Deion Hay. Willard Brown, they also, Negro League players also served in, uh, in, in the Army. And then, of course, after the war, uh, because of the war, that was one of the factors that started to lead the road to um, integration. In, in mm-hmm. Major League. So those are the types of things I'm going to talk about in this class about baseball going to war. And it's interesting, I, you know, I have nothing against Pete Gray. You know, Pete Gray was a one-on player mm-hmm. that played in the major leagues during the war. I have mm-hmm. nothing. It, it was a, it, it's a story of determination, but it was just interesting that they major league owners would look for a handicap guy before thinking about maybe bringing in uh, an African American player. It's, yeah, it's, right. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, you know. To think about Joe Nuxall, who was a major league pitcher. He was, was 15, 15, years, 15 old. years old, yes. <laughs> and he made his major league to be. Eddie, Eddie Geidel was that time period too, right? That's, 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 <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> you can, you can only um, tell people the stories and, and hope that they, that they, uh, they understand. And like I said, it's all about context, right? And, right, and, and, right. and, you know, 
today, uh, I'd like to think, um, you know, we're, we're 60, 70 years beyond World War II. We're, we're 100 years past the 1920 forming of the Negro National League. But that's unfortunate. We still have some of the same uh, situations going on here in the country. And 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 sooner or later, we people just got to stop this nonsense. You know, it, it's just, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, um, and, and, we, and we have to keep the story of Negro League baseball alive. every day. Yes, you every know, day because, yeah. because it's not it's not just a part of African American history. It's a part of American history. Absolutely, baseball history, American history, everything. Yes, that's, world that's history. Right. You you got it. Right. right, it is. It is. Yeah, it's it is. inspirational. It's right. it's uh, it's transactional in a way because people, the guys at the time, had to do what they had to do in right. order to right. uh, to make it work. Uh, and so in a way, you know, in a way it's interesting, right? Because that's something that, uh, um, you know, it's like poker, right? You got to play the hand you're dealt. And, yes. and that, oh, that yeah. was the, <laughs> the that hand was at that time wasn't the best one. And, and they, they did the best they could uh, and kept pushing, right? Kept, kept, kept at it. Uh, right. Don't give up. <laughs> All right, man. This was great. I, I really appreciate your time on here. I, I, I think uh, – we covered a lot. We talked about your book. Uh, we talked about all those players. I, I, I want to keep telling these stories and, and get it out there. When, when you're when you're getting closer to your class and, and your other projects down the road, we'll revisit this again. You come on back here okay. and tell us more about uh, what you're doing down the road. Okay. Okay. That I I, I love to do that because I love to talk about it. I love All right. To talk. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw up my normal regular. Uh, let me just. I mean, you, you can. You are more than welcome to stick around. I'm gonna do a, a quick. Uh, if you see on the screen, that is the out of the park um, simulation program. This is 1920, the okay. Negro National League, and 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 just for your benefit. Um, and, and I've mentioned this every single time. I've taken some liberties here, right? Uh, we, we talked about the, the, the black press wanting the Negro National League to have, or baseball, colored leagues to have a standardized baseball schedule. It's kind of what I've done here. They're going to play 140 games. Uh, the Eastern Colored League didn't exist yet in 1920. And, and I've set that up because I wanted to have the Lewis Santops and the, and, and the Cannonball Reddings and, and some of those players. Uh, Joe Williams is on the, uh, the Royal Giants. Uh, you know, I wanted those guys in this league. And they did play some crossover, right? They played, right. The, you know, right. a loose, you know, right. Uh, right. uh, affiliation. They played some games, right? So the intention here is to show these players uh, uh, because every every player is rated uh, like you would for uh, regular scouting uh, for various abilities of their their overall stuff, movement of the ball, control, stamina. Batters are rated on uh, uh, their ability to make contact, power hitting, speed versus righty, lefty. It's just like you know, uh, the same way you would you would evaluate a player uh, in in um, today's Major League Baseball. And so each player has got uh, you know I've tried to go in here and make sure every player's got the correct dates of birth and where they were born and and their their even their personalities, their picture, everything to get them uh, as close to the feel and and their abilities that I could. And and it's just to give another avenue of trying to teach right i mean this is just a simulation we're going to see things in here as the season goes on you can see here uh chicago has just the dayton marcos actually got out to a a 9 and 0 start they've cooled since that first or 7 and 0 they've actually cooled since that first week or two of the season uh, but the american giants have assumed the top spot a game ahead of the st louis giants dayton kansas city monarchs um over in the east Brooklyn, that's a tight race there. Brooklyn, the Bacharax, Havana, all tied at the top. So you could see the the um, statistics as the games are played. So I'm going to go ahead and just play some games. You'll see how fast this happens. You can, you literally can play a game pitch by pitch if you wanted to, and it would be as long as a regular baseball game, obviously. Or it will play a game in in a second. So when I go ahead and I hit finish today, uh, you'll see that. Just that fast. It's played all the games, updated all the statistics uh, behind the scenes. And, you know, we see Chicago lost. Ooh, their third straight loss for the American Giants. So you can take a look at their schedule here and see um, 
who the upcoming games are. And what I started to do, which was kind of fun last week with Todd Peterson, uh, was I added a barnstorming game in there where the, uh, the Giants, St. Louis Giants had, had played, of course it was after the season, they had played the uh, St. Louis Cardinals in some barnstorming games, and we, we did one of those. And, of course, the Giants got stumped, but then the Cardinals had Hornsby. And, uh, and you know, so that, that made a, a difference. But uh, I'm going to start doing that uh, in, in future weeks, adding on off days of the schedule. So you can go in here. You can see the box scores of, you know, uh, how these guys did. I mean, it is just like – as close to a real life simulation. There's even a front office where we're not using financials, but you could set up. There's uh, Rube Foster, owner of the Chicago American Giants from LaGrange, Texas. And uh, you could set ticket prices and you have budgets. And, and if you were playing with those rules in the future, you could have free agency and, and all of the modern rule five drafts and so forth. So multi-year contracts. We're not using that here, but, uh, and so, you know, part of this, I was at a little dilemma where I was debating whether or not to let the major leagues integrate because here is the regular major league baseball season. There's the Washington senators on top of Cleveland by a game. Uh, the giants are a game and a half ahead of Cincinnati. So the same thing is happening here. The games are being simulated Babe Ruth with 10 home runs already. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go ahead and, and see wow. if uh, let them integrate, but I didn't want it to turn into 1948, 49 all over again and have the major mm -hmm. leagues take all the best Negro league players. I, I wanted to have at least one season of the Negro league. So people could get an idea of the teams, who was on them, um, the personalities uh, and then that sort of thing. And just to have a little fun with this and uh, play a game, play the simulation and teach at the same time and that's that's the whole purpose of this so i'm just going to buzz through a couple of games here a couple of days on the schedule and see how things are going uh, i'm going to take it to the following sunday so so like i said just that fast it plays the games um but if you wanted to you could go into the schedule and you can play the game um here's a game uh, it's, for example, Detroit uh, at, at Indianapolis, Webster McDonald, Jim Jeffries. So if you wanted to manage the game yourself, you could do it. So all those options are here, but I don't want to take too much more time on this. We, we talked a lot about the, the, the real history. This is just simulated history to have a little fun with it, but we're still going to keep on doing this uh, and, and uh, see how this comes out at the end of the day. So look at Dayton, six in a row they've won now. Cuban Stars West are really struggling. Six and 18. What's going on there? <laughs> Hilldale's not doing so good either. And I'm going to go to Sunday. Uh, the 30th. All right. So we are at Monday, May 31st on the standings here. And... Chicago 17 and 9, a game up on the Giants, the Marcos, the Stars, KC three back. So you can take a look at the uh, uh, players, Jelly Gardner with 13 stolen bases. I mean, it's just fascinating. I, I love this kind of stuff. I mean, to be able to see uh, Heavy Johnson with six home runs for the Giants and Doc Dudley leading the National League, the Negro National League, and hitting at 394. It's just, to me, it's fascinating. It's a lot of fun. And uh, uh, it, it just, I hope it. Um, it gives people a, a feel for what what these uh, what these guys could do. So that is it. I'm gonna I'm gonna post this to, um, tomorrow. I'm gonna talk with. I'm gonna put you back on here. Tomorrow I'm going to talk with uh, Sean Gibson, and okay. he's gonna talk t about the um, Josh Gibson Foundation that he. Uh, is uh, the executive director of, and okay. where he's going to talk, I'm sure we're going to talk about um, Josh Gibson's legacy, uh, about, you know, uh, the impact of the Negro National League and, and as it came through the seasons and, and, and what that foundation is up to. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Like I said, Thursday night, I'm going to talk with uh, Greg uh, Kreindler, the artist. I could hardly wait to talk to him, too, about how he can – I mean, his, his work is fascinating. Following week, um, like I would mentioned, uh, 
Uh, Professor Brunson is going to be on here. Larry Lester on the 18th. Uh, I've got some out of the park, the game uh, personalities lined up to be on here. I've got several uh, retired players that are going to lined up to get on here because uh, um, I want to get their take on some of this uh, in that perspective. So, uh, like I said, this this was great. I appreciate you uh, okay. taking the time and doing this, and and we'll get you back on here again down the road when you've got uh, you get yourself lined up on what you're working on next. Okay. All right. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, Bye. sir. Bye. Okay. Bye, bye, Kevin. Bye. So there you have it. That is our. Negro National League for today. I mentioned the schedule coming up. I didn't do a simulated game here today because we, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the uh, uh, the players in that 2006 class, and I I, uh, I didn't want to take anything away from that because that was real. <laughs> this is just a simulation, even though this is a lot of fun, and and uh, we do see some interesting things going on here. I, I'm amazed that the Dayton Marcos are still in the hunt because they were not one of the top teams. Obviously, they're beating Havana, the Cuban Stars West, because they are not off to a good start. But, um, you know, it's a long season. Baseball is a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm just fascinated to uh, to hear these stories, talk with these people, and, and looking forward to uh, doing this again. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you.